I'm George Sedano, a star-studded Thursday here on The Jump. Ben Simmons continues to no-show at camp. How good are the Sixers actually without Ben? Carmelo compares the Lakers' expectations to an infamous Olympic team. Is the pressure that high in L.A.? Shaq says if he was a net, he'd ask for Kyrie to be traded. Should Brooklyn feel the same way? And incoming T-Wolves co-owner and baseball legend Alex Rodriguez joins us. The Jump starts now. Hey, what's up? Happy Thursday. I'm joined by NBA champion, my man, Big Perk, Kendrick Perkins. And in a few moments, the host of the Hoop Collective podcast, Brian Winhorst, our insider, will join us momentarily. But Perk, let's start with Ben Simmons as he continues to sit out training camp. The first preseason game for the Sixers is Monday and the regular season starts in 20 days. And Simmons is still holding firm that he will not be with the team. But get this, Joel Embiid responded to The Athletic recently saying this, Quote, I feel like our teams have always been built around his needs, as in Simmons. So it was kind of surprising to see. I mean, the reason we signed Al is we got rid of Jimmy Butler because he needed the ball in his hands. Uh, Embiid added, the situation is weird, disappointing, borderline kind of disrespectful to all the guys that are out here fighting for their lives. Some guys rely on their team to be successful, to stay in the league and make money somehow. So, Wendy, we'll start with you. How do these remarks from Embiid affect the next chapter in this Ben Simmons saga? Yeah, so there's two things to look at. I mean, you can look at what he's saying, which there's some merit to, and we can discuss that if you want. But really, Embiid spending time talking and thinking about this and creating another distraction is a win today for Ben Simmons. Because the, re- the way that this gets, gets settled for Ben Simmons is if the status quo it becomes uncomfortable for the Sixers. Every single day that Ben Simmons distracts from what the Sixers are doing becomes something that's a problem. It pushes the Sixers closer to make a trade. And I realize we're only on day three here and it's not at a critical mass, but Joel Embiid expressing this frustration, Doc Rivers having to answer for a quote that he gave back in June. All of these things are the reasons why a holdout works and why it's designed to do this. And so today, uh, ring one up in Ben Simmons' column because the Sixers had to spend time away from their day worrying about it. Well, you, you know what, Wendy? Listen, I, I really think Joey is going to be don't live at this moment where he was frustrated. Right, and part of it was because of the holdout situation. I get that, but listen, and you know, uh, any type. All right, we're having holdout, we're having some technical difficulties here with Perk. Um, he, here's the deal, Brian. I, I mostly agree with you, um, and, and I I think it is a win for Ben Simmons. But you know, if you're Joel Embiid, like. Why even make these comments? Like, I get you want to be honest, but it, it just feels the completely opposite of what the organization was trying to do. As you mentioned, you know, Doc Rivers went on um, you know, a tour, a media tour recently and discussed how much they need Ben, how much they want Ben in the fold. Uh, and he even went as far as to say that his comments were misunderstood at that press conference, which, you know, we can question that later. But I just don't understand why the need to say this if you're Embiid. Yeah, because he's probably frustrated, George, because he's seeing these things and he's like, you know, he he pretty much threw him under the bus or, you know, blamed Jimmy Butler's departure on him today, um, you know, and he's sort of saying, you know, look, I, I'm, I sort of feel a certain way and I'm, I'm maybe tired of holding back. And, you know, on Monday at media day, you could tell that there was a unified front from the Sixers to still keep the door open for Ben to come back. And, and Joel was on board with that, how much on board he was, you know, only he knows, but you could tell today that, you know, he was a little bit wavering on that. He, he also said, listen, I got to find focus on the guys here. He doesn't want to focus on the guy who's not here, but but that's what he's talking about. And you think he's frustrated. Think about Josh Harris, the owner. Tomorrow, and I guess today, because of how direct deposits work, <laughs> they got to make a decision on whether they're going to pay Ben Simmons the $8.2 million he's owed as part of his contract. Now, um, I know that if I were Josh Harris, I wouldn't want to pay a guy who isn't reporting to camp. But I also know if you don't pay him that money, you're increasing the 
rhetoric on this. And by the way, you will create another distraction because it will get public that it hasn't been paid. And you will be talking about that for a few days. And Ben Simmons, for not getting his $8 million, will get his $8 million in a pound of flesh, uh, causing that distraction. This is the exact point of the holdout. As I said before, every single day that we are focused on something beyond who is there for the Sixers and it makes them uncomfortable, it pushes them closer to trying to end it. And that is what Ben Simmons wants. Perk, now that you're back here, just kind of give us your thoughts on that. Sorry, we lost you earlier. No, it's, it's fine. But I think it's more so about MB, right? Now it's about the 76ers making sure that he's happy, right? And he just finalized to the world today that this marriage is over, right? The divorce papers has been served. It's been finalized. Everything is over with. And look, I knew it was going to get to this point. And Wendy and George, you both were right that a holdout, this is the part of it. But now... And B is saying, okay, cool, we'll move on. You don't want to play with us, we're not going to beg you. And I actually love it from Joel and B because he's not hiding it, right? He's not saying an uh, unnamed source. No, he's coming out and saying how he feel. And this is how he feel right now, and I can respect it. We all know Joel and B to be vocal about situations, be vocal about how, he's, how he feels about certain things, whether it's on social media or not. But he always backs it up and he never runs or hides. So I knew that at some point the players in the locker room was going to say, you know what, if Ben don't want to be here, so be it. And I feel like he's not just speaking up for himself, but he's speaking up for majority of those guys on how they feel in that locker room right now. I, I think the fact that these two guys couldn't make it work is is just wild to me on a on – a, and look, I'm not blaming any single entity here by any stretch of the imagination, but the numbers when they're on the floor together have been fantastic uh, for a number of years. Uh, so it's pretty wild. And, you know, Brian, your point, the Jimmy Butler aspect of this is fascinating. I'm sure Jimmy Butler is somewhere in Miami just kind of cackling, laughing at the way all this <laughs> is playing out. So uh, not good considering their rivals uh, with the Heat, uh, you know, the Sixers are for that matter. So let's move on here. According to Bobby Marks, Here's what Simmons could face in fines, up to $50,000 for media day, increasing fines for missed practices, $227,000 per game, and that could even increase to $300,000 as the season moves on. So, Perk, if Simmons continues to sit and the Sixers continue to allow him to sit and wait this whole thing out, how good are the Sixers without Ben in their lineup? Well, I strongly believe that they're still the playoff team without Ben Simmons. When you look at, you know, an MVP candidate and Joel and B, and you're looking at Tobias Harris, a guy that had a career year under Doc Rivers, who thrived, who strived well under Doc Rivers, you know, coaching system, along with Seth Curry, Tyrese Maxey, you know, all those guys that could put the ball in the bucket. Look, you have a guy, Matisse Thibo, who's one of the best wing guard defenders in the game today, and Andre Drummond, so they're still a playoff team. Here's the thing that the Philadelphia 76ers have to be careful about for us, you know, finding Ben Simmons, right? Like, you know, a guy not showing up, that's one thing, but, you know, Ben Simmons could say, you know what, i show up, but i show up in street clothes. I show up and say, hey, I, I got back spasms or whatever the case may be because you can't. If a guy has a doctor report and says that he's not able to play but he's still showing up to work, then you have to pay him. So the 76ers are in a bad spot right now because Ben Simmons can say, you know what, I show up, but I just show up in street clothes. So they have to be careful with finding them. Yeah, wow. It, it is going to you be. Know, I know that. Ahead, I know that finding feels good. Finding him probably feels good for the Sixers and feels good for their fans. They are not going to be able to find their way out of this situation. Because here's something else. If Ben Simmons comes back, if they work out a deal for him to come back, they're probably going to have to give him most, if not all, the fine money back as part of a deal for him to come back. And if he gets traded, you know, if he gets traded to Team X, and he's now Team X's new franchise player, a new you know, all-star player, they're not going to not give him that money back. They're not going to start off by not paying him the money. So he may not have it the, the pay in his, in his bank account on pay schedule. But for right now, Ben probably believes he's going to get all of that money. And whether that's true or not, that's, not, that's going to keep the fines from bothering him. That's just the reality of the way the NBA works. The Sixers saga will continue. We will certainly keep a close eye on it. Speaking of which, let's move on to another saga with the Lakers. 
As they prepare for their chase for an 18 championship, one of the newest Lakers, Carmelo Anthony, is putting all the pressure on himself, saying it's his most important season and that the expectations are certainly a title. He told the Million Dollars Worth of Game podcast, quote, it's going to be like when Team USA lost in 2004. It's going to be that kind of feeling. So we're going to have to get away for a little and if we don't make this thing happen. So I know what's at stake, but that's what makes it fun, though. So, Perk, do you agree with Melo's comparison if the Lakers lose this season and don't win a championship, that it's that kind of pressure, like the 2004 Olympic team with uh, Wade and, and LeBron and, and Carmelo back in 2004? Absolutely, I agree. I couldn't agree more. There's so much pressure on the Lakers to win the championship. Look, when you have six Hall, future Hall of Famers on your team, and I don't don't give me nothing about age, right? Because two of those guys are still in their prime, and Anthony Davis and Russell Westbrook, and one of those guys is just is just not human. And LeBron James, and you pair them up with the other guys that they built around them, a floor general like Rondo. It's nothing but to win a championship, right? And so what Melo is saying is he's actually leaking good information. We all have speculation, but now when you come out and you confirm that y'all go in-house is to win the championship, that's what we want to hear. And I embrace this. I actually love that Melo saying that because he's putting pressure not only on himself to deliver, but he's putting pressure on the, on his teammates to make sure he holds them accountable that the goal at hand is for us to deliver another title to L.A. I, I would give Melo some advice, not that he's looking for that for me. Don't bring up the 2004 Olympic team yeah. because people kind of forget. He's, he's one of the greatest Team USA players ever. People forget. Not that it was his fault. And I don't want to compare it to this Lakers team because that 2004 team was thrown together with like days to spare before the Athens Olympics. They had mismatched parts. They had a lot of talent, but it didn't fit together. Kind of like this Lakers team. So let's not bring that up, Melo. Let's talk about a different uh, comparison. And here's the thing. Obviously, the Lakers are going to have high expectations, but they are not the overwhelming favorite to win the title. They absolutely could win the title. It could happen, but they've got to do it and they may prove it perk before you throw your head back they may prove it we may be sitting here by christmas and saying boy they're awesome but uh they still have to prove it they got like 12 or 13 new players we've never seen a team with 12 new players come together and, and win so if they prove it we'll take our hats off to them yep. but that's what the 2004 olympic team got upset by a team that played better the argentinians and they were a great team that wasn't much of an upset in all honesty yeah, but, but, but Ryan, if we was talking about some youngsters, then I would have a problem with it. But we're talking about a group of veterans. And not only a group of veterans, we're talking about a group of veterans with a whole lot of championship experience, right? So it's not veterans that haven't been to the promised land. When you talk about LeBron James, you talk about Trevor Ariza, you talk about Dwight Howard, you talk about Rajon Rondo. So just those four guys alone, the championship experience that they bring along with AD already winning the championship. Like, we're talking about a team that's already knowing what to do, and that's sacrifice, right? So sacrifice is the huge point in this. It's not dealing with a whole bunch of youngsters that don't know or, ha or still have hidden agendas. Yeah, I think we may have lost Perk there. But what, what I would add to you is this. Um, I, I, I'm with B on this one, Perk. I, I got to be honest. That is not the comparison I want to make, even, even just, just like in passing, uh, the 2004. And by the way, uh, you know, they did lose a game to Greece, too. Just let's not forget that aspect of the equation. It wasn't just Argentina. Sophocles Shortsonitis, who was a Greek shack at that time, is what they were calling him. Uh, you know, tore up the U.S. And let's be real, the real reason they lost uh, in 2004 had nothing to do with Carmelo or Wade or LeBron or Carlos Boozer. And it was Richard Jefferson, as we saw there, right? That was the yeah, reason yeah. they lost there is because Richard was on the team. But, 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 George, Brian, listen, if Melo was on the team and he's telling us exactly how he feel or he's telling us, giving us example. Who are us to argue or debate with Melo, a guy that was actually sitting on or playing for that 2004 Olympic state? Yeah, look, I, I just think that ultimately it's just not the comparison I would want to make. You're like To Brian's point, he's been on a lot of teams that won on the Olympics. Um, I get what he's saying, that if they lose, that it would feel like that time, right, when he was in 2004. I, you know, I just don't even put it in the atmosphere if I were him. That's just me. Uh, anyway, coming up. <laughs> 
As Kyrie's vaccination status looms over the Nets, Shaq says he'd tell the front office to trade Kyrie. We'll discuss that in a moment. But first, it's time for our distant replay from last year's bubble. Check out LeBron arranging AD and Russ around him so that they line up as 360, 360. Perk, is, is 360 a cool nickname for the Lakers' big three or no? Uh, I mean, it's, it's different, but LeBron knew what he was doing. He just wanted to be in the middle of the damn pitch. <laughs> You're right. You're right. That's what I thought. <laughs> You know, it's a weird numerology with the Lakers. They've got 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 9, 10, 11, 12. 1 through 12, except for Kobe's, actually 0 through 12, except for Kobe's retired 8. This is, we've never seen an NBA team like this. That, I, I, numerology must mean a win, right? Must mean title. I mean, listen, I, at least for their hopes, that's what they're expecting or hoping this is the case. Little season. For sure. And I believe that was a CVS he might have been in doing some uh, shopping there. All right. Allegedly. Allegedly. All right. Let's shift to one of the more intriguing offseason storylines. What should the Nets do with Kyrie Irving? Monday, Irving missed Nets media day in person because of his vaccination status, which could have him in jeopardy of missing some significant time this upcoming season. Yesterday, Shaquille O'Neal was on the Tiki and Tierney show and had a fiery take about Kyrie. Let's take a listen. I would, I would go upstairs and say, get him up out of here. Whoever, whoever owns the Brooklyn Nets. So, Wendy, what's your reaction to Shaq's take on Kyrie Irving? He wouldn't do that because if he was in position to, to form a team, he would know that Kyrie's talent is so rare that you just have to hold your nose and, and go through with it. If Kyrie was in one of these major companies over the last couple of weeks that have fired employees uh, because they have not you know, been compliant with uh, vaccine protocols, he, but he is one of one. There is nobody like Kyrie in the league, and his talent gives him a, a, a slack and a leeway that almost nobody else in America would have in their job. And unfortunately for the Nets, he intends to test that leeway to the nth degree, and he continues to test it, and the Brooklyn Nets continue to, uh, to, stand up, to, to put up with it because they know how darn good he is. But I will tell you this. He's not getting that contract extension. He is eligible for that big-time contract extension, $180 million, somewhere in the neighborhood of what Durant got. I don't see how they could give it to him under the current circumstances, and maybe he doesn't even want it, uh, considering mm. where he's at in his life right now. But that's something that Kyrie is missing out on, is the opportunity to guarantee more money right now. Now, Perk, uh, let me ask you this. If you were Kyrie's teammate, and I believe you have been, if I recall correctly, would you want him traded? I mean, you know what? When you when you're trying to win a championship, right? And and, and this is I'm a role player, so you you got Shaq that's that's speaking from a guy that was actually a franchise player. But when you're trying to win a championship, you need everybody all in, right? So you're looking at at Kevin Durant, you're looking at you have James Harden, right? Without Kyrie Irving, the Nets are still a contender in the in the NBA for us winning the championship. But I wanted to go back to Brian's point about Kyrie Irving and the power that he has talking about, you know, that he's one of one. It's not necessarily the power that Kyrie Irving has. We have to talk about the power of Kevin Durant. Because in my opinion, if Sean Marks had it his way without really having to consult with Kevin Durant, I think that he possibly would move Kyrie Irving. That's just my opinion. But knowing the relationship and knowing that Kevin Durant has Kyrie Irving back, that's the power that Kyrie Irving has. And that's why Kyrie Irving is allowed to do these Kyrie Irving type things and do the things and get away with it is because he knows that Kevin Durant is going to ride with him to the wheels fall off. All right. Well, again, you know, a lot of drama going on before the season starts. And we'll keep a close eye on all of it, including this net story coming up. A new era of Timberwolves and Lynx basketball ownership is officially underway in Minnesota. We'll talk to Alex Rodriguez, our friend and colleague. He's coming up next right here on tonight. Game two in the best of five WNBA playoff semifinals are on ESPN2 and the ESPN app. MVP John Quell Jones and the top seeded Sun look to even up the series at one when they host the Sky at 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific. Then it's the Mercury taking on the Aces who lead that series one game to none as well. Welcome back to The Jump. I'm George Sedano, now joined by the incoming co-owner of the Minnesota Timberwolves, Alex Rodriguez, of course, colleague here at ESPN. 
A-Rod, thanks for joining us, brother. Good to see you. Great to be here. My first time on the show. I'm excited. All right. Well, let's get right into it. Why did you want to get involved in NBA ownership? Well, I thought, look, we, we took a, a hard run at the Mets and we got uh, try to get it smart on it. It was a long process. And through that process, we understood the sports business a little bit better at the ownership level. And when the T-Wolves opportunity came up, uh, Mark and I got very excited. We're very bullish on the NBA. It's a global sport that has tremendous leadership on the Adam Silver and uh, has a young demographic. And then you have, you know, a set of owners over 30 teams that are very intelligent, some of the world's best investors in a very progressive league, which all those things excited us. Now, I know you got a wide network here, you and Mark as well, but who did you chat or maybe consult with, uh, you know, as far as advice in regards to being involved in ownership? Was there someone you leaned on, maybe inside or even outside of sports? Yeah, Jerry Reinsdorf has been a longtime friend and mentor. Uh, his son, Michael, who, who runs uh, the Bulls daily, uh, they were very helpful. Mark Lajery, Mark Mastroff. Um, there was a lot of folks that I reached out to that all had very consistent thoughts and ideas about the NBA, where it is today and where it's going. And uh, we feel very bullish. We feel great about the business. We feel that it's, it's growing at an incredible pace. And uh, there's tremendous opportunity both on the, on the court, on the business side, and also socially in Minnesota to be able to give back and bring people together. So... How did you feel maybe your playing days will help you in this particular role? I mean, I, I think I understand how players uh, feel. I can, I can see the game through, through their eyes. I understand how hard it is to win a world championship. It took me 15 years as a player, and uh, I'm really excited to take on this challenge and journey. And the way, George, that Mark and I are looking at it is really being long-term greedy over the next two years really get as smart as, as we can before Mark takes over. But for the time being, uh, you know, Glenn Taylor's the man in charge. We're here as supporting cast, and we're thrilled to be, uh, you know, mentored by, by Glenn Taylor, who has a long, rich history with the NBA. Now, when you were a player, what did you appreciate about the owners you played for? You know, and you played for a number of them, including some high-profile ones. And how will that help you? I think playing for George Steinbrenner was one of the big – um, thrills of my career. I mean, George, who should be in the Hall of Fame, uh, isn't yet. Uh, I'm hopeful he does. But he was the first one that taught me about VCP, right? Vision, capital, people. And nobody had a bigger, clearer vision uh, than George Steinbrenner. He, he understood that the New York Yankees wanted to be the number one brand in the world when it came to sports franchise. He told me he's going to deploy capital and, and not take any shortcuts. And then he's going to go find the greatest people in the world to come wear pinstripes and to be around the pinstripes. And those are lessons that I'll never forget. Uh, he was so invested, uh, not only financially, but emotionally. So that's one that uh, I took take as my role model as an owner. Who have you chatted with on the T-Wolves roster, players, coaches, etc.? I've talked to almost every player. You know, I've got to know him. We, we threw a nice dinner here. Mark and I hosted a dinner at my house in Coral Gables in Florida um, just about a month ago or so. Uh, and obviously going to practices and getting to know the players. Uh, this is going to be a slow process, George. We have um, a lot of catching up to do. We have a great teacher in, in Glenn Taylor. But we're really excited to ultimately get our NBA here uh, of NBA basketball in the next few years. Is there a little extra special connection with your fellow Dominicano, Carl Anthony Towns, or no? Well, yeah, not only Dominican, but also a New Yorker. And uh, he's a great guy, very dynamic. I just spent a few days with him, and he is in terrific shape. He's inspired. That morning, he was working out at 6 in the morning and rallying the troops. So... He's looking forward to having the best year of his career, and uh, there's a lot of energy, good energy around uh, the Timberwolves right now. What are the expectations this season, Alex? I think the expectation is to go out and have a good year, really stay healthy. I think that's really, really important. But, George, we're looking at this as a, a long, long-term plan. We're not really uh, thinking about what can we do this year, but how do we build a foundation uh, with core values uh, and we're doing a lot of work behind the scenes with Glenn and, and Mark on how do we build a foundation that's sustainable for the long run. And, uh, you know, if we want to be a championship team in three and five years, how do we work backwards? 
So that's kind of the fun part that we're involved in right now and, uh, and it's exciting. And for you personally, what does it mean for you to be one of the few Latino owners in sports? Yeah, I mean, well, you know, uh, George, in many ways, you, you've broken glass as well. And we've had some great role models that have paved the way for us. But for my responsibility as, as a Latino and, and a man with brown skin, just like Magic Johnson was my friend and mentor and someone who inspired me, uh, it's funny how he spots a basketball. <laughs> but what, what really inspires me is that he's brought other uh, men and women of, of brown skin, minorities, into the boardroom with him. There's not enough just for us to be in, but what, who can follow us? And hopefully any young men and women out there, like I teach my daughters, um, can be the next president of the United States or can be the next CEO of a big public company. Um, so I'm excited to be hopefully uh, one that paves the way for others. All right, I'm going to put you on the spot here before we let you go. Your Canes are playing on ESPN tonight against Virginia. Give me a prediction for tonight. Uh, well, it, it's Thursday night, ESPN 7.30. So I'm going to say we win by a field goal. Oh, okay. All right. So win by a field goal. There it is. We'll mark it down. Alex Rodriguez says Canes by three tonight. Alex, an absolute pleasure, man. Good to see your face again. Great to talk to you. Good luck, and we'll talk to you soon. All right. Thanks, George. All right, Alex. Thank you very much. Anthony Davis says this year he's on board to play more center. But is it BS or real talk? We'll discuss that on the other side. Plus, here's what the jump recommends on ESPN Plus today. Bobby Marks goes through what every NBA team could offer in other games here on the jump. The ball deserves to go in the crowd after a bull move like that. I think it's bull. I just thought it was uh, bull. Don't give me that crap. <laughs> Yes, it's time for BS or Real Talk. We provide a quote, and you tell us if it's BS or Real Talk. It's fairly simple, okay? So first, Anthony Davis says he's finally ready to play more center with the Lakers. Let's take a listen. That was the expectation, um, and that was discussed, and I expect to play center. I'm not sure, you know, what's going to happen. Me and Frank talked about it a couple of times, um, and that's the plan. Um, right now, nothing is set in stone. But uh, we want to see what that looks like, and I'm comfortable with that. Um, obviously, there's times, you know, where Dwight or DJ, you know, might get the start at center depending on games. But uh, for the most part, I think the plan um, is to go with me playing center. All right, Perk. AD actually going to play more center. BS or real talk? It's real talk. It's, it's real talk. And he has to play more center, right? When you look at this Laker lineup and you look at their roster, right, they're going to benefit more at him playing the center position. You listen to Frank Vogel and what he said yesterday, right? right? He said, hey, we want to get out and transition, basically. We want to get out and run. And so getting out and running, meaning Anthony Davis at the center position, is going to be phenomenal. Plus, I look back at him and Russell Westbrook, right? Together in the pick and roll. You need space and move Le LeBron James to the four. Maybe have Carmelo Anthony out there with another shooter and somebody else. It don't matter. But Russell Westbrook and Serge Ibaka used to master the pick and roll where Serge Ibaka used to get wide open elbow looks for the 15 to 7 foot, 17 foot range. Anthony Davis and Russell Westbrook, and you move him to the five at the center position, it's going to be lights out. And I said it before, I said it again. There, this is the best big that Anthony, that Russell Westbrook has ever played with. Uh, I'm going to go 100 on it. I'm going to go real you, talk. Kirk? Go ahead, Brian. <laughs> I'm saying he Russell Westbrook played with you, Perk. What about what about where you rank in those uh, that hierarchy? I like yeah, that. I, um, I like that. You know, AD gave that quote and said, "Yeah, I'm going to play more center," and then spent a minute saying about how he wasn't going to play center. <laughs> and it, the Lakers better hope it's real talk because in the playoffs, and I don't care about November or January or whatever, but in the playoffs. You can't have Russell Westbrook and Dwight Howard out there for key possessions on offense. The teams won't guard them on the perimeter. You have to have a floor stretcher to create space for LeBron James to go to work. So it has to be real talk. Otherwise, the Lakers aren't going to have a chance to win in the postseason. All right, listen, the reality is the numbers bear it out, hence why it's real talk. And I think he realizes at the end of games or certainly in the postseason, to Brian's point, that it's unbelievably effective. I believe the Lakers have outscored opponents 
by over 153 points in the 1,250 plus minutes or so that he's played center. The math is there for you. So real talk on that. Next, Blazers point guard Damian Lillard found inspiration for staying in Portland from the recent title runs, as he told The Athletic. Here he said, quote, I was sitting there and I was like, it can really be done. That's how I feel. It can be done. And said that after watching Milwaukee specifically, I was even more convinced, he said. So, Brian, the Bucks inspiring Dame to ride it out in Portland. BS or real talk? Well, I, it's kind of BS because he, he watched them win, and then he spent the rest of the summer, like, hedging about whether he wanted to be there. Now, I know he's in now. Now he's made it clear he's in. But he was on the fence after watching that. Uh, you know, if I was a cynic, which I am, I would say he watched them trade for Drew Holiday and thought, how about we trade a whole bunch of draft picks and stuff for a player like Drew Holiday, which they did not do. So maybe it's kind of real talk to Scott. Perk, what do you think? Well, I, I mean, sorry about that. My internet keeps going in and out because it's storming out here in Houston right now. It's kind of like the release date of the Donda album by Kanye West. It just kept going in. <laughs> so, yeah, wait, apologies. you don't control the weather, Perk? What's going on, man? Come on. Apologies on that. But look, listen, I think it's real talk, right? When you, talk, when you think about Damian Lillard, let me tell you why I think it's real talk. The voice in the locker room. He's been able to sit down with Chauncey Billups. We got to remember, I keep going back to Chauncey Billups winning that championship in Detroit. They weren't heavy favorites when they won the championship. Matter of fact, they were slept on a lot, right? I know they made the trade and got Rasheed Wallace, but it wasn't like they were just dominant, right? And when you look at the Portland Trailblazers and you look at them offensively, they're one of the best teams offensively. They could go to go to war for a score with the best of them. Defensively is where they lack at. And defensively, a lot of it has to come with you within, right? Accountability. Like playing with Ray Allen, he wasn't known as the best defender. Playing with Paul Pierce, he wasn't known as the best defender. But when you get when you get a voice and you get a coach to challenge them on the defensive side of things, a guy that already been to the mountaintop and won the finals MVP, then all of a sudden it's a different song in that locker room. So I think it's real talk. I'm going to say real talk because I know Dame, uh, I think it, it, it does tug at his heartstrings to want to stay in one place. Whether that continues to be the case, we'll see. Lastly, out of Miami, after a second season without as much fanfare as his first season in the bubble, obviously in his playoff run, Tyler Hero told the Miami Herald, quote, I'm ready for a bounce back year, no question. I feel like I had a lot of expectations coming into last season and some people are sleeping on me again. In that way, I'm going to wake up a lot of people again like I did in the bubble in my first year. So, Perk, Hero says he's waking people up, that they're sleeping on him in year three. BS or real talk? That's BS. First of all, nobody was sleeping on him. Matter of fact, Tyler Hero made me look bad because I said before the season last year that he was going to make the All-Star team. I had high expectations for him. So nobody is sleeping with sleeping on him last year. I'm actually sleeping on him right now. And he has to show me, instead of talking about it, that he's capable of actually going out there and deliver. So right now it's BS. All right, let's talk about real talk, and that's real money. This is his third season. This is where you get paid or not as a player on your rookie contract. If he's the type of player he was last year, that's a good guy for a late lottery pick like he was. He'll make $15, $16 million in his next contract. If he's the guy he was in the bubble, which is the real talk he's talking, he will be a $25 million a year player, and the Heat will have a difference maker, not just a high-quality player. Uh, less is a year ago. By the way, Perk, you weren't the only one who was uh, banking on Hero. The Miami Heat wouldn't put him in trade talks for James Harden. They said, we got to hold on to this guy. Mm. And that didn't look so good after Harden was lighting it up in, in Brooklyn and Hero was not having a great season in Miami. So the Heat are invested in this being real talk, George. Yeah, I think they are invested, no question. But I'm going to go with Perk. This is BS. I got to see it to believe it. All right? If people were sleeping on you, it's because you put them to sleep. So wake them up. Let's go. Let's see what you got. All right. <laughs> Up next, the Nets and Lakers and Bucks, and the Warriors for that matter, have the shortest odds to win the title. But who would be the best 